in translation, the special event of 2021 seminar series organized by the Center for Translation Studies, University of Leicester. It is special for two reasons. One is that we have speakers and participants from all over the world. A benefit of today's otherwise unfortunate circumstances. We appreciate that some of our participants are actually staying up in the middle of the night to attend this event. And what makes it more special is that it is a sequel to an event held in 2017, organized by our then colleague Anna Milsom. At the time, it was called Overland Oversea Journeys in Translation. And today, we are revisiting the journeys that have been taken over the past three years. The poems have certainly traveled farther and move widely too. They are now in Italy, speaking Italian, in Romania, in Romanian, and even more are on the way. For the journeys of overland, oversea, we have many people to thank for. To thank for. Ambrose Musiawa, poet and editor, he is certainly the main force of driving this project forward. Poets such as Joanne Lindbergh, Lila Thompson, and Sybil Ruth. And of course, translators Monica Manlaki and Pietra Deandra. We also should thank various voluntary organizations across Europe in supporting this project. Civic Leicester, Mosaico Azioni per i Refugiati, Watch the Med Alarm Phone, and the Leicester University of Sanctuary. We are very pleased they can all be with us today. Without further ado, we'll start the event now. Now, what I would suggest, because currently this event is being recorded and it will be made available later to all of you. So uh, if those of you who are not speaking, please turn off your um, camera. No, sorry, turn off your microphone. Yeah. That for your attendees, there will be a session of questions and answers later on. We will first welcome three voluntary organizations to give a short talk. And the first will welcome Philip Horspool, chair of the Leicester University of Sanctuary Steering Group. Phil, could, yep. would you like to speak? Sure. Hi everyone, uh, nice to virtually uh, uh, meet you all. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we do at the University of Leicester and what we've been doing, particularly uh, under under COVID and um, more than happy to take questions uh, later on. So I'm not going to go into a lot of background information other than to say that as a university, we are a university of sanctuary and we seek to find ways to support uh, and work with refugees uh, and asylum seekers in the university and work with many uh, uh, many other groups across the city and, and actually beyond. So um, I think, you know, you don't need me to tell you that uh, the world changed in uh, March and became uh, very difficult for everybody. And um, it became even more difficult for our sanctuary seeking students and, and those doing um, other activities with us from that time. So I think probably in that, this period, we've all kind of suffered from uh, loneliness and kind of, um, you know, feelings of desperation, et cetera. Well, I think if you could probably imagine they're multiplied for m many of these people are also going through the arduous process often of, uh, of seeking asylum uh, in, in, in this country. Um, however, um, we, we have managed, I think, to continue to support um, our, our students uh, as well as we can. Um, you know, 
we, we found things like, you know, we put our programs online, but of course, you know, that has an assumption that people have the facilities to do the programs online and uh, not everybody did. Fortunately, we've managed to um, beg, steal and borrow kind of uh, laptops and, uh, and and other bits and pieces to to support um, uh, our students. So they in, in the main, the majority have been able to continue uh, with their studies. Um, but, you know, it's been even more than that. I mean, um, you know, we've had literally and I'm not, you know, students studying on our programs who are struggling to kind of eat on a daily basis. They're struggling to find places to, to, to live. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they're struggling with loneliness. And I think, you know, all of these things we're kind of trying trying to help. We did a fundraising event where we raised two thousand five hundred pounds and half of that money we've used. Um, to support our own sanctuary seekers here with with some of the things that I, that I, I mentioned before. Anyway, as I say, we have continued to offer our, uh, language programs, which are free of charge to refugees and asylum seekers, whether that's a full time pre sessional program, which uh, allows students to get up to the level needed to get entry into university or whether it's free classes through City of Sanctuary or WEA. All these things are happening online and we're, we're supporting whenever we can. Um, also, I'd like to mention that we continue to support um, refugee doctors through the OET programme as well. Um, so um, RefuAid is an organisation that uh, we work closely with and we ran an online programme for, uh, I think it was 10 doctors and we've got another one coming up in, in, in January as well. Um, the scholarships that the university has for campus based were all taken uh, this year. So we have um, uh, four uh, new scholarships starting this year, as well as the distance learning scholarships that we've got in um, history, politics and international relations. Um, my, my department uh, also have a scholarship for an online EAP uh, program. Um, actually, we had such amazing applications this year that we actually uh, gave three scholarships to to uh, refugees and asylum seekers. So that's been uh, really good. So um, there are more students studying with us and there are more uh, refugees who are studying at the University of Leicester and beyond. And they're able to do this because they've managed to get their language level up and they've not been charged for those programmes. And as I keep banging on to the university about, you know, um, they shouldn't always just view this as, oh, it's a cost. I'm not saying that they do. They're very, very supportive, I, I want to say. But, you know, we are getting an increasing number of fee paying refugees. I mean, think what you like about paying for fees. I don't think it's a good idea, but that's what most of us have to do. And so do they. So, um, but, you know, it's great to see some of these students who I can remember whose like English level was very low, maybe 18 months ago, now actually starting degree programmes or going off to Leeds or Newcastle or to other universities uh, to do um, uh, degree programmes. So it's really great. Um, so uh, I just very briefly just update you on the, the support that we're getting across the university and the profile that we've got across the university. So I've had two papers with the executive board of the university, one in January and a follow up paper about two weeks ago. Um, the follow up paper, which was approved unanimously by executive board, uh, has as its vision to become an international centre of ex excellence in supporting refugees and asylum seekers to become not only sector recognised for the excellence of our provision, but to attain global recognition. Um, I'd like to think that as an institution, we're already recognised for our excellence across the country. But, you know, I think we want to reach out beyond that. We've got lots of really great practice, but we still have a, a, a lot to learn. I've got a, a, a list of things. As I say, this has been approved at the highest level by the University of things that we would like to do. We want to better be able to kind of keep details and track what our students do whilst they're with us, but also what they do beyond. We, we've, we've started to do that. Um, I mentioned accommodation earlier. We're in the process of ensuring that um, we have some free accommodation places, not only for those who come to study at the University of Leicester, but you probably know that there are um, those whose asylum seeker status is approved, and then they often end up homeless before you know because they're just basically kicked out of their accommodation. So we've been working with the Red Cross. Um, 
and we're you know, we're we're hopeful that very soon we will be able to offer you know university accommodation for sort of six to eight weeks to help those people before they can you know get their own own accommodation sorted out. Um, I think we, we want to work to make sure that there are more volunteering opportunities and try and get our student body more, more interested. We want to find opportunities for refugees and asylum seekers to, uh, to, to do some work where they are able to under government regulations uh, with us in the university. Um, and we're going to st start having um, sort of a, a weekly support for all of our RAS students across the whole of the university, that, like drop-in sessions every Friday where if we don't know the answers to their problems, we, we, we can kind of uh, help them as well. I just want to give a shout out to a couple of my colleagues, Pascal and Julie, who the, the support that they've given people over the last sort of eight or nine months is just absolutely phenomenal. You know, I mentioned stu you know, talking to students who have actually just not got enough food to live on and, you know, coming and helping us to find a way of supporting those students and just being there for them to talk to, uh, I think, is, is is just been really important. So um, it's a great event you've got lined up today. I'm really grateful uh, for being invited. I don't want to take up too much more of your time because you've got lots of really fantastic things to talk about. But that's an update about where we are um, with Leicester. I think the final thing that I would say is what's been really encouraging for me is many, many other universities across the country have been in touch with me in the last 12 months asking for advice. Many more of them are now becoming universities of sanctuary and going through that process of becoming accredited. And I think we're starting to build up a real network of opportunity for uh, refugees and asylum seekers to study in higher education. And it's and it's about time. Thank you very much, Phil. It's really exciting to hear all what has been um, going on and what the future will be like. Thank you, Phil. And the next will speak for Watch the Mad Alarm Film. Clara, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, many thanks for inviting us to this event. We are very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Chiara Denaro. I'm a social worker and researcher, and I'm part of Watch the Mad Alarm Film Network. So I will briefly present what the Alarm Film Network is and how our work is somehow related to yours, to the translation and interpreting work that you do, and to your book project, Overlands Overseas, Journeys in Translations, which have migrant voices at its core. Uh, Watch the Medal Arfun is a transnational network which, provide is, uh, which provides assistance to people in distress at sea through a 24 hours uh, uh, outline available for seven days a week. Um, it is operated by a multilingual team that is composed by a volunteering human rights activist. Uh, the Alarm Phone project was launched in October 2014, exactly one year after the 11th of October shipwreck in 2013, in which at least 268 people lost their lives. And amongst them, there were more than 60 minors. Uh, the 11th of October uh, 2013 shipwreck is one of the most controversial incidents ever. In fact, as denounced by several journalists, um, Italian and Maltese authorities were probably responsible for the delay in rescue, which caused the death of all these people. Uh, now there is a trial, so a number of Italian Navy and Italian Coast Guard officials are under, under investigation for lack of rescue, and this claim for justice would not have been possible without the effort of many, many people like you maybe, whose daily work is focused on listening and to amplifying migrants' voices. So um, after this incident, we started to think about how to situate ourselves and how to act and to react in order to avoid similar tragedies. And at that time, there were some individuals who were receiving hundreds of calls from the sea, as for example, Father Musid Zerai from Eritrea. And uh, in the frame of our reflection on a possible project, we asked him what in his view was missing in terms of support to people in distress at sea. According to him, uh, cultural mediators, uh, translators, and people who could have been able to communicate with persons on board of the boats should have been a fundamental component of a possible project supporting persons at sea. As EU countries, Coast Guard could only speak English, while most of the people on the move could not. 
So when we started in October 2014, the network was composed by about 60 volunteers in different countries, amongst which Germany, Italy, Greece, UK, France, Spain, and many others. But now we are uh, over 200 activists who live on both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. And during the past six years, uh, we have assisted over 3,300 boats in distress in the three regions of the sea. So, uh, in particular, we received calls from all the three migration corridors, so the Western Mediterranean, the Central Mediterranean, and the Aegean. And um, we are called by people who are traveling from Libya, Tunisia, and sometimes Algeria to Italy, or from Turkey to Greece, and from Morocco to um, and from Morocco, Algeria, and Senegal to Spain, or to Canary and to Canary Islands. Uh, in addition uh, to distress call from the sea, we often receive calls from people who are not at sea. Uh, for example, we are called by people who are looking for missing relatives or who ask for help while in detention or maybe who have been shipwrecked survivors or victim of a pushback to or put back by a country which is not safe and where migrants' rights are at risk or systematically violated. Um, amongst them, there are, of course, Libya, sometimes Tunisia, Morocco, or Turkey. Uh, our, our will is not only to support migrants in distress at sea in order to help them uh, get rescued and to reach a safe, uh, safe place, but also to document the systemic violence of the border regime and the continuous struggles of people on the move. Um, a fundamental tool that we use to achieve these goals is that to listen to migrants' voices, to receive and to amplify uh, migrants' requests of help by collecting their testimonies and narratives concerning violence which they experience at the borders. And through these practices, what we attempt to do is basically to make their voices heard by more and more people. Um, what else? Uh, as a large form, we believe that border violence is a, a systematic result of contemporary border regimes and that authorities should be accountable for the human rights violation that people on the move experience on a daily basis. And uh, when I talk about border violence, I mean a wide range of practices that we observe. Uh, amongst them, there is, of course, the, the lack of assistance uh, of migrants in distress, the delay in um, providing rescue, uh, which in several cases uh, has caused avoidable incidents, as well as uh, as well as the EU cooperation uh, with governments uh, of unsafe countries in order to facilitate the capture of migrants who attempt to flee. So uh, I'm going to conclude. So um, many times during our activities, we keep calling Coast Guard without receiving any reply. And in other cases, uh, the persons on board just tell us that there are aerial assets watching at them for, uh, from above, but there is no rescue inside. So unfortunately, most of the times, this systemic violence is kept invisible. While through migrant voices and testimonies, we are able to make it visible. So, um, because of this, we are very happy to to support your book project. Uh, because yes, the project Per Terra e Per Mare, uh, over, la over <laughs> land and sea, contributes to make visible the border struggles carried out by persons on the move through their narratives and voices. And this is what we also try to do every day, uh, standing beside them, fighting against violent borders for the freedom of movement, for equal rights and global justice. And uh, yeah, we'll conclude with a quote for, uh, from our last report. So with every alarm phone shift that we do on the phone, we try to remove a brick from a wall and add it to a bridge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thank you. Um, you what you have said already um, got some attention. And Lila, Lila has asked the question about your website. So I'm sure uh, other people have the same question here. So if you can share your website in the chat box, or maybe email me, and I'll send out uh, for the email. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chiara. And the no next, problem. we are going to have Yagub uh, Kibeda 
um, speaking for Mosaico Avioni Para e Refugiati. Forgive my pronunciation, I can't speak Italian at all. <laughs> Yaguba, please. Sorry, you are muted. You are muted. Yeah, uh, it's very difficult in this historical moment, which uh, human relationships are becoming more complicated. So poetry, as it, it was in the past, could help us to build a new universal language. Uh, in recent years, Mosaico has tried to create space to build a new narrative where diversity should be seen as uh, a wealth, as a rich text. Uh, this text, uh, these poems, uh, uh, could could be an additional tool for our comment, uh, um, commit, uh, commitment to the community, where we try to make a contribution. Uh, in the moment of which there is no longer uh, certainties, nor territories, nor depend on a local events. Every event is universal now. The new um, we need to create uh, spaces in, like this one, in which uh, um, to acquire uh, reference uh, values uh, of solidarity uh, that uh, now is more than pressing. We need, and as in the past, even today. Uh, uh, the credibility of the the boy, uh, poets helps to awareness campaign in human rights and solidarity, and um, which involve people even uh, uh, in this uh, uh, initiative uh, could involve people even before they they read read the book. Uh, that uh, knowing that they are donating to support and important causes. Uh, this book helped uh, to build a new memory of migration and will be a contribution uh, uh, to the answers uh, that next generation will ask why all these people died on the sea. Um, Mosaico uh, is a grassroots organization based in Torino, uh, in Italy. Uh, in the late of 2006 uh, by a group of refugees from different countries to promote self-reliance self of refugees and support their integration and active participation in the city of Torino and Europe in the more, uh, more proudly. Mosaico's over objective is to provide new narrative for refugees as a resources and uh, as um, that contribute to the development of the host communities while supporting protection capacities and networks for refugees and their families. We have different projects uh, that help from uh, refugees that kicked off uh, from uh, reception centers after they get their status. Uh, so they live in squads and uh, they don't have, uh, especially in this moment of uh, COVID-19. So. Uh, we are helping uh, 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 those refugees in in uh, uh, to over uh, in their daily life, and also we have uh, different projects like the University of Turin, and uh, and uh, uh, we start very um, uh, simple by translating and recognition of diplomas. Uh, helping them in orientation and uh, and how to join university, uh, but we discovered that after that they they can they could not continue, so they they interrupt their studies and uh, and uh, we uh, uh, try to monitor that and we find that uh, um, they need more they need more. Uh, to support support in uh, housing, in uh, study materials, in uh, uh, 
tut uh, tutoring uh, uh, tutoring and 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 also psychological support so we we get this uh, uh, project uh, to help refugee students uh, uh, financed by Otto Permille, the Valdesian Church, and uh, from that we 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 uh, uh, we provide a concrete help for these this refugees to continue their passion, their studies, and uh, and not interrupt their their dreams. So uh, we uh, also have a lot of support from the University of Turin from association france Fanon, that psychologist and and uh, also from uh, professor that uh, uh, I, I i would like to mention in particular uh, victoria franzinetti because she uh, helped refugees with languages uh, uh, ielts course in english and also uh, Simona Titaliani and Roberto Peneducci and, and a lot of the University of Torino, they help us uh, uh, um, in our project. Uh, the Municipality of Torino also helped us with job uh, grant for refugees students after they finish their uh, studies so they can practice uh, what they have studied in uh, internship. And also, um, we get a very generous donation from the Higher Commissioner of Refugee, Filippo Grandi, uh, in these uh, days of uh, uh, COVID-19. And we dedicate this uh, donation to, uh, to distribute computers to refugee students, because uh, most of them, they connect with a mobile phone and, and all they have old computers and and so forth. So uh, we dedicate all the uh, the donation we get from uh, Filippo Grandi. We thank him for that. Uh, that we appreciate so much. And uh, uh, and uh, we um, uh, our our dream is also to uh, uh, that we could make uh, student corridors for refugee students that came from refugee camp also they can come to Italy uh, or Europe to, to study and to continue their studies. So uh, we are also about to uh, to fulfill a new project in coaching so that uh, can be like uh, uh, orientation and coaching for refugees and asylum seekers towards uh, uh, job and, 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 and social inclusion. Um, the fundam two fundamental elements uh, underpin uh, our work is voluntary and peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, uh, uh, including both refugees and people from the host community and using multi-stakeholders approach, which involve local authorities also. Uh, the organization was entirely run by volunteers and activists for its 11 years uh, with this uh, uh, three, with three people person become uh, paid the staff in, in uh, 2019 but uh, we, we work uh, uh, in, in, uh, in this uh, as volunteers for long years so um, thank you very much and I'm very happy to be with you Thank you very much, Jakub. It's so good to hear all the efforts in helping with this course. Um, now we are going to hear the poems. So we'll start from Joanne Lindbergh. Joanne, would you like to yes. read your poem? Yes, Say a few words about your poem and maybe, um, yeah, please. Yes, you can hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, well, uh, one of the editors, Kathy Bell, approached me for some poems uh, for this, for Overland Oversea, and I didn't have any new ones, but I had some from uh, the collection I published in 2007. And I was saying earlier that the issue of refugees and asylum seekers seemed so urgent in the noughties, and it was urgent, and it makes me sad in a way. 
that I mean, I'm happy to see all these wonderful efforts that people are doing towards it, but it makes me so sad to see that it hasn't been, you know, that things haven't improved. Um, and I think somebody said something about poetry reclaiming language, and that's something I do quite a lot. I take language that's out there in the culture or out, out there politically, and I take a look at it. And uh, there was a lot then, uh, as there, there is now, about people coming into the UK hiding in lorries, and that there would be freight at the at the UK port with people in and the people were being smuggled um, over the border. And I came across the idea of a backscatter scan and I'll read my note. Um, the word backscatter refers to a kind of X-ray technology which can be used to obtain particularly bright and detailed images of materials such as explosives, firearms, drugs and human beings which might otherwise remain undetected. So it detects kind of um, organic matter. So there's a person, you know, we, or people are so dehumanized in all sorts of ways when when they move across borders, particularly when, when, when they're seeking asylum, when they don't have documents. And I thought that is so cold. And I thought about writing in the uh, language of this machine. So there's something like scanning now, please wait, which you might see on any machine if they have a sort of progress bar. And uh, the word aliens. Um, I, I was interested in refugees and migrants in this book, partly because as a, a European Jew in the UK, I come from migrant stock and the Aliens Act um, which was the first Restriction on Immigration Act passed in the early 20th century was actually passed because there were too many, they thought there were too many people like me coming over from Eastern Europe. And they talked about all the things they talk now about being swamped and overrun and blah, blah, blah. They talked about Eastern European Jews in the early 1900s. Um, and I was thinking about what it means to be an alien without documentation and to be organic matter. And and I thought, how horrible, how cold. And um, this is actually a, a pantoum, which I think is an import. It's very much an imported um, poetry um, form, as a lot of poetic forms are. They, tran you know, we, 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 we have English sonnets and we think of them as terribly English. But of course, sonnets are French and Italian. You know, we poetry always crosses borders. And the pantoum, I think, um, is from Indonesia and it repeats lines. And, and, and I, I'm very interested in repetition in poetry. A machine would be repetitive and there's also something repetitive about these movements across, you know, the uh, across borders and these attempts to uh, prevent them. History repeats itself. So I'm going to read that now. Backscatter song. Scanning now, please wait. There's something organic hidden in this freight. I see blood and panic. There's something organic showing up bright white. I see blood and panic captured in my light. Showing up bright white, clear as contraband, captured in my light. Aliens may not land. Clear as contraband, I see desperation. Aliens may not land without documentation. I see desperation hidden in this freight without documentation. Scanning now, please wait. Thank you. Um, the other poems, so, so many set out. Um, Again, I was thinking about failed arrival of different kinds and what present, prevents it and how we're so often judged and thrown out. Um, and I started out with uh, also in the book, I write about having had a miscarriage and I think about all these bab or babies that uh, didn't make it far enough to this world, however you characterize it. Um, and I thought about um, those images you see of baby turtles running into the sea and some of them get caught and you know not many of them will come back as adults and there's something sad about that but that every one of them is a hopeful little life an experiencing creature 
And I thought again about the language we use as we talk about deprived people, disaffected people. We talk about bogus asylum seekers, which is horrible, horrible. We talk about deselection, deselection of MPs. Um, and also I was thinking about all these reality programmes on TV. We're, we're obsessed with judges and hierarchies. We all sit at these exams that let it, with a little bottleneck that lets a few people through. And we all watch these programmes with judges where people get thrown off and, and, um, and, and one person will win and that's the best person and everyone else somehow is by the wayside. And um, and I ended with the word pending. I suppose I thought this is still ongoing. Like I said, with the repetition, the other this this isn't over. You know, there is there's, there's always hope for people coming forward, but we need to remember what didn't make it and empathise with them and remember them. And it, it's got a nursery rhyme structure because nursery rhymes actually, you look at them, they're really quite brutal. They're not nice at all, and they're often comments on brutal um, political events. So, so many set out. One was miscarried and two born too soon. Two hatched at dawn but were eaten by noon. Five were deprived and five disaffected. Six were mistaken but never corrected. Seven were stranded and eight more were drowned. Nine were stamped bogus and sent to the pound. Ten lacked direction. 11 finesse, 12 met the judges but failed to impress, 20 were shelved and 30 rejected, 50 lost face and were soon deselected, 100 were stories with no proper ending, thousands undone and a million pending. And I look forward to hearing the translations, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you're muted, Jan. OK, now it's OK now. Thank you very much, Joanne. Yeah, so let's hear the translations. So Pietro, would you like to go first if we yes. still? Yeah. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you, Joanne, for your reading. Uh, so I start with Beck Scatter song. Scansioni in corso, attendere, prego. C'è qualcosa di organico nascosto in questo cargo. Vedo sangue e panico. C'è qualcosa di organico, appare bianco e luminoso. Vedo sangue e panico. La mia luce l'ha preso. Appare bianco e luminoso, chiaramente di frodo. La mia luce l'ha preso. Alieni, vietato l'approdo. Chiaramente di frodo, vedo disperazione. Alieni, vietato l'approdo, senza documentazione. Vedo disperazione nascosta in questo cargo, senza documentazione. Scansioni in corso. Attendere, prego. And this is so many set out. Shall I? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Così tanti in cammino. Uno abortito e due precoci. Tre schiusi all'alba, ma mangiati veloci. Quattro bisognosi e cinque negletti, sei in errore ma mai corretti, sette lasciati a riva e altri otto annegati, nove marchiati fasulli e poi scaricati, dieci privi di rotta, undici di eleganza, a dodici i giudici respinsero l'istanza, venti furono archiviati e trenta respinti, cinquanta scartati senza essere distinti. Cento erano storie senza il finale atteso, migliaia distrutte e un milione in sospeso. Thank you for listening. I don't know if it's Italian, but it sounds just a little beautiful. Thanks. So uh, let's move on to another poet. And we got uh, Lila here. Lila. Maybe we should um, slightly change the way we present it. Maybe you'll read one poem and followed by translation. How's that? We just vary the form a little bit, maybe. Um, oh, I'm wait. sorry. No, we we still missing Romanian translation here. So I didn't <laughs> see Monica on the screen. I'm like, I'm terribly sorry. 
Uh, Monica, are you still there? I can't see. Ah, oh, yes. OK, please, let's hear Romanian translation of Fujian's poems, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, it's nice to be here. I'm going to read the poems in uh, Romanian. Cântecul retrodifuziei. Acum scanăm. Vă rog așteptați. Văd ceva marfă organică ascuns în bagajul pe care îl cărați. Văd sânge și panică. Văd ceva marfă organică. E albul acesta strălucitor. Văd sânge și panică expusă la proiector. Albul acesta strălucitor e contrabandă cât pentru 10, expusă la proiector. Sunt străini, nu vor trece. E contrabandă cât pentru 10, se sizez disperare. Sunt străini, nu vor trece, fără documente clare. Se sizez disperare, ascunsă în bagajul pe care îl cărați, fără documente clare. Acum scanăm. Vă rog, așteptați. This was the first one and the second one about the turtles. Um, atât de mulți au pornit la drum. Pe unul l-a pierdut și pe doi prea devreme i-au ouat. Trei au crăpat oul în zori, dar până la prânz i-au păpat. Patru au fost deprivați și cinci înstrăinați. Șase au fost confundați, dar niciodată returnați. Șapte au naufragiat și încă opt s-au necat. De nouă au zis că sfalși și în cușcă i-au băgat. Zece au pierdut calea. Unsprezece îndemânarea și-au uitat. Pe doisprezece i-au văzut jurații, dar nu i-au impresionat. 20 au fost dați la o parte, 30 refuzați, 50 s-au făcut de râs și brusc au fost îndepărtați. 100 au fost povești, fără un final de valoare, 1000 au rămas neterminați, un milion în așteptare. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Equally, I don't know anything about uh, Romania, but I'm sure, um, like attendees are here, we really enjoy this. It's just they're so beautiful. Um, then we are going to move on to Lila's poems. As I was suggesting earlier, maybe we'll vary uh, the format a bit. So Lila will um, read her poem and then maybe followed by Romanian translation and the Italian translation, and the second poem by Leila, and the Romanian and the Italian. How's that? Okay, excellent. And um, Leila, over to you. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, delighted to be sharing these poems today. And um, this first poem is called Landing on Lampedusa. I wrote it after proofreading a friend's dissertation, all about um, the refugee support um, provided on the island of Lampedusa and also the lack of support sometimes as well on that island. Um, so I tried to condense the dissertation into one quite small poem. And I have always been struck by how some people choose to turn off the news if they hear something that is upsetting. But those same people that I know who do that will very happily watch wildlife documentaries. So I thought I would use the story of a turtle making its natural migra migration um, to try and explore the story of people who need to flee for the, their own safety. So interesting turtle theme is emerging today. Landing on Lampedusa. Scoop by scoop. She drags her whole story onto the beach. She is a helmet towed by flippers, scarred by sharks and rudders. She does not have a tag. The sharks saw to that. So arrives on a cloudy night in between civil wars. When the landing area is quieter, when fewer people 
come out to watch. She heaves the cargo she will never see alive, but knows they are whiter than the moon they have not seen. Her cargo has been squirming since the sea stopped rocking them. And this is the closest they will ever be. For if they ever meet after shells have hardened out on the waves as they vie for a broken crab, she will never know she is starving her own flesh just by trying to live. And that's all her blank eyes in their leather hood can focus on. She looks past the muddled tracks of army, police and border patrol, just scoops and drags herself past the headlights that are scanning this stranded seaweed mess. None of this matters to her, to her heaviness when the moon is urging her on. She just scoops and drags herself past the lost bikinis, peroni bottles, and single sandals that walked deserts to get here. Thank you very much, Lila. So we are going to hear Romanian translation. Yes. Monica, please. Thank you. Debarcare în Lampedusa. Puțin câte puțin, ea își turăște întreaga poveste la țărm. Pare o cască trasă de labe de not, zgriată de rechini și de vâsle. Nu are etichetă. Au avut rechinii grijă de ea. Așa că ajunge într-o noapte cu nor, dintre două războaie civile, când la debarcader e mai liniște. Când vine mai puțină lume să se uite. Își ridică povara de ouă pe care... Nici când nu le va vedea prinzând viață, dar știe că ele sunt mai albe decât luna despre care încă nu au habar. De când marea nu le mai leagănă ouăle de țestoasă freamătă într-una. Și cam aceasta este toată viața lor. Că dacă se vor întâlni vreodată, după ce carapacea li se va fi întărit, departe în valuri, când se vor bate pe un crab frânt, țestoasa mamă niciodată nu va ști că își înfometează carnea din carnea ei. Prin însăși încercarea de a trăi, singurul fapt la care ochii ei goi, acoperiți de ploape, se pot concentra. Privind la urmele de noroi lăsate de armată, de poliție și de grănicieri, ea doar se adună și se tărăște mai departe pe lângă farurile care cercetează haosul acesta de alge șuat la mal. Dar ce contează toate astea pentru ea, pentru povara ei, când luna o îndeamnă să continue? Ea doar se adună și se tărăște mai departe pe lângă bichini pierduți, sticle de peroni și sandale desperecheate, care au străbătut deșerturi ca să ajungă aici. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And uh, Piatras, yes. um, Italian. Thank you, Laila. Sbarco a Lampedusa. L'acqua raccolta nelle mani, un palmo dopo l'altro, trascina tutta la sua storia sulla spiaggia. Lei è uno scafandro trainato da pinne, sfregiato da squali e timoni. Non ha targhetta, a quella hanno pensato gli squali. Così arriva in una notte nuvolosa nel mezzo di guerre civili, quando l'area di sbarco è più tranquilla, quando meno persone escono a vedere. Sussulta per il carico che non vedrà mai in vita, ma sa che sono più bianchi della luna che non hanno visto. Il suo carico si è dimenato da quando il mare ha smesso di cullarli e non saranno mai più così vicini. Perché se mai dovessero incontrarsi dopo che le conchiglie si sono indurite, fuori sulle onde, nel lottare per un granchio spezzato, lei non saprà mai che sta affamando la propria carne, solo perché cerca di vivere. E quella è l'unica cosa su cui i suoi occhi vuoti, nel loro cappuccio di cuoio, possono focalizzarsi. Guarda oltre le piste fangose di esercito, polizia e ronde di frontiera, 
semplicemente raccoglie acqua nelle mani e si trascina oltre i fari che scannerizzano questo disastro d'alghe arenate. Nulla di questo è importanza per lei, per la sua pesantezza quando la luna la esorta ad andare. Semplicemente raccoglie acqua nelle mani e si trascina oltre i bambini smarriti, le bottiglie di peroni e sandali spaiati che avevano camminato nei deserti per arrivare qui. Thank you. Thank you, Pietra. Um, so, yes, um, Lila, say wonderful to hear. Indeed. Um, Lila, would you like to move on to your second poem, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, this next poem is called Please Look After This Bear. And those of you who read Paddington Bear when you were little might remember that when Paddington Bear arrives from Peru in London, um, he has a tag around his neck saying, please look after this bear. And Paddington Bear has often been used to help children understand what being a refugee, what being needing to seek asylum actually means. So I use that on purpose. Um, this poem was inspired by a photo taken of a park in Budapest, uh, where many refugees have been sleeping um, about, and I think the news had come that there was no more, that, that um, the last train to leave Budapest was leaving. And so families just abandoned possessions, children's left toys, because they were closing the borders of, of that country. So this is a, again about um, seeking asylum, about taking that journey but through the eyes of not an animal this time, but an object or a toy. No, toys are not objects. They're definitely people to children. Please look after this bear. In a Budapest park today, the bears woke alone. Only a stray sock and sweet wrapper to remember their carers by. Dust, salt and sand crust their hobbled paws. Arms droop from walks longer than their Chinese stitches had prepared them for. Their cocoa, pink and honey coats are grubbily fading from all they have pillowed and heard before ears were left on razor wire at the Serbian border. Their soft labels with faint instructions were twisted through fingers in lines that stretched to forever and back again, till there was nothing left about hand washing at 30 degrees and never tumble drying polyester. Nothing printed in all these warnings about keeping all bears a safe distance from sarin gas, barrel bombs and shrapnel. Their eyes were sewn and re-sewn from many a mother's hem to stop the smaller world collapsing. And now they watch cameras snatching the park at dawn whilst the last train heaves. The bears gaze out through screens and papers, surrounded by headlines screaming panic or pity, straining to see where their children have gone. Okay. So, yeah, Monica, please. Vă rog, aveți grijă de acest rus. Vă rog, aveți vă rog, aveți grijă de acest urs. Astăzi, într-un parc din Budapesta, urșii s-au trezit singuri. Doar o șosetă răzleață și o folie de bomboană ne Le cad brațele obosite de la mersul pe jos, un drum mai lung decât pot rezista plasturilor chinezești. Blănița lor cafenie, roz sau aurie, se murdărește, gerpelindu-se de la cât se rează mă și de la tot ce aud, iar mai înainte și-au lăsat urechile în sârma ghimpată de la granița cu Serbia. Etichetele cu instrucțiuni, aproape șterse, au fost răsucite între degete. 
la cozile care se întindeau până la infinit și înapoi, până când nu mai rămânea nimic din spălatul de mână la 30 de grade și nu centrifugați odată poliesterul. Nu scria nimic pe etichetă despre cum trebuie ținuți urși la distanță față de gazul sarin, de explozibil și șrapnel. Ochii le-au fost cusuți și răscusuți cu ață din tivul mamei, pentru ca lumea celor mici să nu se năruie, iar acum urmăresc camerele de filmat cum prind ele imagini cu parcul în zori, în timp ce ultimul tren se îndepărtează greoi. Urșii se uită în jur, privesc la ecrane și ziare, înconjurați de titluri de o șchioapă, țipând panicați sau cu milă, străduindu-se să afle încotro s-au dus copiii lor. Piatra, over to you. Thank you. Per favore, abbiate cura di questo orso. In un parco di Budapest oggi, gli orsi si sono svegliati soli. Solo un calzino spaiato e una carta di caramelle con cui ricordarsi dei propri custodi. Polvere, sale marino e sabbia incrostano le zampe claudicanti, le braccia fiaccate dal tanto camminare, cui le loro cuciture cinesi non li avevano preparati. La pelliccia color rosa, miele e cacao si sta sbiadendo sudicia per tutto quel che hanno sentito, cui hanno fatto da cuscino, prima di lasciare orecchie sul filo spinato al confine con la Serbia. Le loro morbide etichette con tenui istruzioni sono state attorcigliate tra dita in linee allungate all'infinito, per poi tornare indietro finché non è rimasto nulla riguardo al lavaggio a mano a 30 gradi e al non mettere mai poliestere in asciugatrice. Nulla in queste avvertenze sul tenere tutti gli orsi a distanza di sicurezza da gas sari, barili bomba e granate. Gli occhi cuciti e ricuciti dagli orli di molte madri per impedire al mondo più piccolo di crollare e ora loro guardano fotocamere catturare il parco all'alba, mentre sussulta l'ultimo treno. Gli orsi osservano tutto intorno attraverso schermi e carte circondati da titoli di giornale che strillano panico e pietà, sforzandosi per vedere dove sono finiti i loro bambini. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pietra and Monica. I didn't want to say anything. I felt at the time there was such a natural flow from English to Romanian and to Italian. If I had said anything, it would be disrupting this beautiful flow. Um, I'm sure, um, like me, you all have the um, many questions, but we will have a question and answer session later. So we are going to invite Sibyl here to read her great aunt's poem as well as her translation. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to st start by saying I'm of German Jewish ancestry. So if you go back to the 1930s, um, the family story is one of attempted migration of coming to new countries and very struck hearing speakers at the start that the sort of 1930s equivalents of those organizations were people who helped my grandparents, my mother, my aunt to rebuild a new life in this country. So, you know, the fact it, it, it just goes round. Um, poetry written in the past, unfortunately, still has continuing relevance. But this is a poem written by my German Jewish great aunt, Rose Schuler. Um, her attempts at migration, there was an obstacle, she couldn't get out of Germany, and she was an inmate of the concentration camp at Terezin, also known as Theresienstadt. Um, she survived there, and she wrote this poem in May 1945, when the camp was about to be liberated. And while this was undoubtedly a joyous event, something that you know people had looked forward to quite desperately, 
There was also then the question of what would happen next. Where would people go? So I'll read it um, first in German, as, as has been said, and then my own English translation. Vale Teretzin. Und wieder reißt das Schicksal auf die Tür und stößt uns nun hinaus mit harter Hand, wie schon so oftmals in der letzten Zeit in Neuland uns noch fremd und unbekannt. Es trieb uns aus der alten Heimat fort, verschätzte uns so manchen harten Schlag. Fast war man schon geborgen im KZ, wohin der Weg uns jetzt vollführen mag. Wir wissen nicht, was draußen vor sich geht, wo unsere Lieben sind, wer das noch lebt. Man ist so wund geworden, dass man schon bloß im Gedanken an Gewissheit lebt. Goodbye to Theresienstadt. So Fortune has made arrangements to eject us. It knocks on the front door with an official hand. This isn't the first time. Once again, we're being moved on towards fresh woods, new pastures, unfamiliar land. Fate got us evicted from our previous homes. It booted us about, pummeled us with its fists. Almost, we begun to feel that life in the camp was safe. Now the way ahead's unclear. Our road is full of twists and turns. Nobody knows what's going on outside, where our families are, if loved ones have been spared. We have become weak. The very thought of being told our future makes us tremble. We are that scared. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecil. That's just so, as I say, beautiful is the word that can describe all the poems and the translations. Um, now, I think, you know, as you probably have noticed, even without knowing the language, we can already hear and feel the resonances in the translation. So I would like to now talk to two translators about the trans uh, their translations. So Monica and uh, Piatra, can I please ask you some questions? Uh, are we reading um, Rose Cooler's poems in Romanian too? Ah, again, sorry, I forgot again, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead, Monica. Yes, please. La revedere, Terezienstad. Deci soarta se pregătește să ne evacueze. Bate la ușa de la intrare cu mâna ei oficială. Nu este prima oară. Ne vor strămuta încă o dată spre noi păduri, spre locuri noi, teren necunoscut. Destinul ne-a evacuat din toate casele. Ne-a dat afară, ne-a snopit în bătaie cu pumnii. Începusem să credem că viața în tabără e sigură. Acum drumul din față e nesigur. E plin de meandre întortocheate. Nimeni nu știe ce se întâmplă afară, unde sunt familiile noastre, dacă au fost cruțați. Am devenit slabi. Chiar și numai gândul de a ni se ghici viitorul ne face să tremurăm. Atât suntem desperiați. Shall I? Yeah, please, Pietro. Addio, Teresin. Così la fortuna ha pianificato la nostra espulsione. Pussa alla porta d'ingresso con mano guantata. Non è la prima volta questa. Ancora ci spostano verso teneri boschi, nuovi pascoli, terra sconosciuta. Il fato ci ha sfrattati dalle nostre case di prima, ci ha presi a calci, riempiti di botte. Dentro al campo pensavamo quasi di essere al sicuro. Adesso la via è incerta, piene di curve le rotte e di svolte. Nessuno sa che succede fuori, dove sono le nostre famiglie, se i cari sono stati risparmiati. Siamo diventati deboli. Il solo pensiero di farci dire il futuro ci fa tremare. Fino a questo punto siamo spaventati. Thank you. 
you. I kind of waited to talk to you about two translations. Um, so yes, um, first question I would like to ask is how these poems have made their journey and landed in your hands. Maybe we'll start from Teatra. Yep, thank you. Um, Yes, it happened quite by chance, and I could not foresee that I would travel with these points for so long because it all started in 2017. I was teaching in a postgraduate course, literary translation, uh, mostly based on post-colonial books, and I was looking for a text for a seminar. And so I came across uh, Ambrose Musiwa's project, International Translation Project. Uh, maybe, Ambrose, you would like to say a few things about the project itself before we move on with this? Yeah, sure. So I don't know if you can hear me. You can hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was uh, Jenny's in translation. Uh, what Jenny's in translation tried to do was, uh, or how it came about was that after Overland Overseas was published in 2015, every year after that, we tried to find a new way of promoting uh, the poetry anthology. And uh, this is Overland Overseas. Uh, we, we, we did this through a number of ways, like we had uh, uh, pop-up poetry libraries, we took some of the poems from Overland Overseas and turned them into postcards, which we gave out at uh, at the rail, railway station uh, in Leicester. And then the following year, we started working on journeys in translation, where we, again, using the selection that had been on postcards, we encouraged other people to translate them into the languages that they that they spoke so the idea was that anyone who was a uh, uh, bilingual or multilingual could ever go at translating and people did a lot of them and uh, with uh, one of the poems again it was uh, translated into a completely different art form it was given a a musical conceptualization that's uh, Trevor Rice uh, Yala. And then with with others, uh, another artist represented the poems uh, graphically using images. So with journeys in translation, uh, the poems that were being translated into other languages, after a time, we started actively thinking about getting as many of the poems in overland, overseas, into other languages, you know, as, as many of them, because already 10% were in 30 languages. So we wanted to see if it would be possible for as many of them as possible to be translated into, say, one language, and then uh, try and see how many of, of such translations uh, we could uh, get the book into, which is where Pietro and Monica came in. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to add that um, when I met, when I came across Ambrose's project, I was thrilled at the idea of involving students in a real project, not a simple classroom exercise, but you know, on something that was very relevant for them, on a much contested issue here in Italy, you know, the, the issue of refugees and the Mediterranean here in Italy is the order of the day. So the main objective was to uh, reflect together on this issue through working on languages and between languages as well. Excellent. Um, how about you, Monica? Um, 
I uh, found about uh, the, the project the Journeys in Translation uh, in the same year, 2017. At the time, um, I was um, collaborating, um, I had been collaborating actually with a local uh, multilingual uh, uh, literary magazine, Contemporary Literary Horizon, and um, uh, through someone who was a collaborator then, uh, a poet from uh, Scotland, the Nail Leadbitter, I found out about uh, the project, so he told me about it, and uh, um, um, as soon as I heard of it, uh, I started to to work on the poems. Um, um, I had been translating poems for um, for um, for some years since I uh, had been uh, since I was in a in a, as a student at the university. So uh, um, another. Um, Thing that motivated me was that uh, um, at the time um, um, I taught uh, translation among uh, other things uh, and I also had um, a group um, of international students uh, coming from the Middle East, from the Far East, um, from some, some time from Africa. Uh, so that uh, happened, uh, these courses, uh, international courses happened uh, uh, until uh, 2019. So from 2019, uh, the English courses for international students here at the university uh, ended. Um, so up until then, um, I had these classes and uh, sometime I used uh, some of these poems. Um, and um, um, in um, and later with the uh, other classes, I I tried to to work with poems. Uh, I mean, with, with Romanian students, to work on poems uh, to see um, uh, how we uh, what attitudes we have uh, um, on uh, on this issue. And uh, uh, some of my students were very receptive, and uh, uh, I decided to go on and translate more poems. And in the end, uh, we translated. Uh, all the poems. <laughs> yes, and uh, one another reason is that I did my PhD in um, uh, British literature uh, with a focus on uh, the poetry written by uh, Caribbean uh, poets. Uh, so that was another reason. It's very interesting that both of you have, uh, you know, your students involved in this project. Um, would you say something a bit more about the challenges that you have come across when working on this project, whether it is about, you know, organizing your students or in terms of poetry, poetry translation? Monica, would you like to start? OK. Yeah. Um... Um, I gave uh, um, all the poems to my students and uh, I uh, let them uh, choose uh, uh, what they um, could translate, what they liked. Um, uh, of course, the poems um, that uh, have rhyme or maybe um, are uh, more difficult to translate because of the form or uh, uh, a specific um, layout or uh, if some of them are visual poems. Um, or they have cultural references, so I let them choose uh, what uh, uh, they understood. And um, um, some of the poems uh, were elliptical, for example, and uh, it was hard for me uh, to translate them, so I had to talk with the, po with the, po the poets to clarify some of the details. Um, um, in terms of organization, not all my students worked on the poems. I just uh, uh, asked uh, those who uh, like poetry. I don't want to force them or to um, approach a subject that maybe they are not interested in. So yeah. I um, I prefer to do this <laughs> to, to do it this way. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this is quite a um, good educational. Uh, way not just about uh, translation practice itself, but also getting students more involved in what's going on in the world today. Uh, Piatra, is this the same case with you in, in your class? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm. Uh, in a way, I, I think I gave myself the challenge when I started the seminar to train the students and myself in this very important exercise of 
putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. Um, and in some situations that are unbelievably different from ours. So the idea was to train ourselves to turn our vision upside down, as one of the poems say, um, which is, of course, a recurrent need, both as readers of post-colonial literatures and as translators as well. And it is also a foundational aspect of our humanity, I would say. And then the challenge I was not expecting had to do with the collective discussions of our translation options, which turned out to be rather lively in many cases. Um, I, I discovered when I started that seminar that literary translation cannot really be taught through a frontal one-way approach. I mean, it's something that online e-learning teaching will never be a substitute for. Um, and the discussions became particularly lively when we had to translate colloquial expressions because the, the seminar group was composed of students from all regions mm. of Italy. So each one was contributing with colloquial or slangly, slangish expressions from their home region. But of course, the poems had to be understood by all of us. So every contribution and proposal had to pass the, it's not very nice to say that here, but the test of nationality, only from a linguistic <laughs> point of view, anyway. Yeah. So these yeah. were the two main challenges, I would say. Excellent. So that's, yeah. Uh, but you have resolved these challenges one way or another. Are you happy with the outcome? I am. I am. Yes. Well, Excellent. I, I can't I can't say about the the final product. Readers will judge. Mm. Readers. I am happy about the degree of involvement mm. on the so students' readers. part. Yes, mm. I really am. Now audience are uh, quite a few audience are here today that have listened to your translations. Um before we can um open up the floor for the audience to ask her questions. I can see Laura already put up her hand. I would very much like to hear more from Ambrose about the overall project and how you are going to see this project is going forward. As I mentioned at the beginning, Ambrose is a driving force behind all what's going on about this project. So Ambrose, could you say a few words more? Um, I think for what 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 I'm hoping for is that uh, we will get uh, as many of the poems from the anthology translated into you know many 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 more languages. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, getting the poems into those languages that have got into languages spoken in countries that have got. Uh, a problematic discourse on migration. Um, we, we've, we've heard from, from Pietra about some of the things that are, and also from, from Cara, some of the things that are happening in, in Italy um, around uh, the hostility that is that is there towards towards migrants, towards people who are, who are moving. Uh, similar things are happening in, in Greece. Same things are happening in, in Hungary, in Malta, uh, and a number of other countries. But at the same time, as there is that state-sanctioned uh, hostility, violence, there is also there are also groups of people that are, are are working as individuals or as collectives to to support people on the move and also to support people who are looking for refuge. Like uh, like mosaic or like uh, like uh, watch the made alarm phone. So the hope is that we will continue to have platforms, forums like this, where where, where we meet each other and we remind each other of uh, the work that 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 people are doing, and the need to to keep intervening in 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 discourse on migration. Thank you. 
because this is what I see uh, over land over sea itself and also the translations as I see them as interventions. Translation as interventions. So it's not just about linguistic or cultural transfer. It has got that power as a way of intervening what is not right. I'm very pleased to hear that. So I'm going to open up the floor and uh, metaphorically here. Um, so Laura has put up your mm. hand for some time. Laura, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for organizing this and to be present. And I really, really appreciate both, I mean, the original poems and then the translation. And it's very interesting also, and this is a discussion I had yesterday with a colleague to involve the students also in the process of translating and getting things done in a sense uh, with the publication of a book. And my question was about indeed the publication of the book. So I see that the Romanian version is forthcoming, but the Italian version has been published in 2020. And even though this is a very peculiar year, and maybe not the best year for new publication, but I, my question was about distribution and events. So have you already have, do you already have an idea of how uh, this book will be distributed maybe in, in the Italian market, I'm referring to Pietro or the Romanian market, and have you already been in contact with uh, future festival and events or have you been contacted by events and festival? Where can we find uh, you talking about this book, this publication, in a way that we can share the words, you know, about this very wonderful and interesting project. Thank you. So, who would like to answer this question first? Pietro, I, would you like to I answer first? Yeah, and then Monica, perhaps. Or anybody would like to chip in here. Um. Thanks, Laura, for your question. Um, in terms of um, publicity and meetings and events, uh, we are still lagging behind a bit for you know contextual reasons. There was supposed to be one public event here in Torino, but it was postponed to next spring, hoping that the circumstances will make possible to have it you know in, in presence. Um, for the moment, my best efforts have been directed to um, trying to have as many reviews as I can of, of the collection in Italian journals and literary magazines and so on and so forth. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully someone will write about it and, and so you know, word of mouth will be spread and, and the news will go around. Um, you, you were asking about publication too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the book is published through uh, print on demand uh, procedure, if I'm not mistaken, Ambrose. Um, and it, it is, it can be bought on a, a um, on Amazon book and um, yeah, so it does not have, let's say, a traditional distribution. And, and, and also, uh, just, just to add on to this, uh, most, most of the time, uh, Joan and, uh, and, and Sibu and, and, and Laila, and other poets who are here might, uh, might 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 be able to add uh, to this. But normally, with uh, with poetry, most of the the sales take place at at events. Uh, this year is th there are not many physical events that can take place, so we we have to move online. Uh, that can have an impact on uh, the number of, uh, of of copies we can actually sell. Uh, but the the hope again is that 
because we are online, uh, we might actually potentially be able to reach uh, a wider audience. Uh, one of uh, the challenges with uh, using the platform that uh, that I used to publish the book, uh, Amazon is again the reputation of of uh, of, of 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 Amazon, who are possibly the the filthiest capitalists in the world. But uh, at the same time, uh, the the book industry is 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 really challenging, especially uh, with uh, with books that are that are that are, are doing what we are hoping that uh, that uh, these translations will do. We have to find a way of uh, of of making uh, these poems travel. And uh, for me, as a as a publisher, as an indie publisher, uh, that way of making the translations happen for now is Amazon. So I don't know if I apologize for that or if I say, uh, or if it is one thing that I have to be grateful for. Mm. I don't know. Sibyl, um, have you got a question or you, uh, what, anything uh, yes. you yeah, have to say? To add to what Ambrose was saying, mm. and also because I gather that you're planning to release the film of this event on, on YouTube, that as Christmas is coming up, then people can obviously, you know, link to the YouTube film via sort of social media, maybe mention the existence of the book. I imagine Five Leaf Bookshop has got some copies as well, so it would be possible to order direct from them if you want to sort of support independent bookshop and independent publisher. So I think we can perhaps perhaps use the coming together, this different people connected together to to give the project a bit of a boost at a time when live readings aren't possible. That's all. Thank you, Sybil. Thank you. Um, anybody else would like to add to this question or do you want to have uh, other I comments? Think, yes, I think Monica, I would please. I'd like to say a few words about um, the reception and how uh, I'm thinking of uh, promoting uh, <clears throat> the poems. Um, so um, the audience of uh, the, trans the translations in Romanian um, has been also um, 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 the Romanian translators. So, for example, some of these poems were translated into Romanian for a Romanian based uh, uh, translation project. Um, and I must thank uh, uh, to um, uh, this uh, website called Translation Saturdays. Uh, and. Um, <clears throat> I also made a presentation about the, about the whole uh, project in um, in Rome in September uh, 2019 um, um, uh, for the European School for uh, Literary Translation. Uh, so um, I presented this project there, and uh, um, I, um, I discussed uh, some of these poems with uh, the participants and. Uh, I think uh, this is also a kind of audience and uh, um, most of the participants were uh, teachers and uh, I think uh, they can uh, relate to, to, to the project. Um, and in the future, um, of course, the students will be uh, um, an, um, an audience and uh, also I'm thinking of uh, promoting the book uh, um, in any way uh, possible, but I think that the online uh, uh, possibilities uh, are uh, the best at the moment. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? I can see we are coming to the end of our scheduled time, so it's really last the chance for you to ask your questions, please. Um, oh, I had oh yeah, Lila, please go on. Hi, um, I was wondering about the translation process. Um, is there often a, a sort of a rough draft, a very literal draft, and then the second attempt is trying to bring some of the, the, the feel of, of poetry to it that makes sense in, in the language? I was wondering how, if there were some sort of different stages for that translation process.
in my case, that was a pattern, a working pattern that um, proved especially useful with the most difficult or obscure poems of the collection. That is to say, we tried to uh, write down a rough version first, taking in consideration mostly the, the contents, the message of the poem, and then we would work on that. For other simpler poems, we went, you know, straight towards the, the final version, hopefully. And yeah, so it depended on that. Um, it's, it was uh, easier, of course, with the poems that uh, have a straightforward uh, message. Um, whereas um, with uh, the others, um, of course, there were a few stages. Um, <clears throat> um, for example, the rhyming uh, poems, uh, of course, there is one uh, draft uh, in which I write uh, um, the, the each and every meaning uh, that I see. And then there are a few others, uh, a few other drafts uh, until I find uh, a good rhyme, um, um, a good uh, maybe adaptation. Sometimes it's difficult to put together uh, the same words in Romanian, I mean, the corresponding words uh, from the corresponding Romanian words. Um, and um, um, sometime um, it was difficult uh, with the elliptical uh, poems. Um, and I realized that uh, when after I talked with the, with the poets, that I realized that uh, most of these elliptical poets had a big uh, trauma uh, behind. Uh, so um, uh, I had to re reshape the poem into Romanian so that uh, um, um, it didn't uh, tell too much about uh, the subject, but at the same time uh, express uh, this uh, ellipsis. And and also Sibu, uh, you are also a translator. Uh, you you made you made decisions. Um, yeah, I did. I mean, I think I found them quite difficult decisions, um, partly because I was translating a poem by somebody who, who, who died some years ago and, and who had lived through obviously considerable trauma at that time. So, you know, there's a sense of the ghost of my great aunt, you know, like, is it all right for me to do this? But she hasn't sort of come and haunted me, nothing terrible has happened, so I must assume it is okay. But I think there were questions about kind of faithfulness, because I think translation always involves a bit of reinventing and a bit of compromise. And I felt what I had to do was, I, I, the most important thing to help, felt to be sort of faithful to the musicality and the, 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 the rhymes that she used, but that that meant changing things. I think I, I modernised her in a way, but mm. I, I feel that that, that was probably legit because I felt that I just wanted to speak to people as clearly as possible, but I didn't want to just to sort of write a kind of historical piece. It, it was the immediacy of her writing that really struck me, and that was what I felt I wanted to, to, to translate. Very interesting uh, when you said it's modernised it a bit. Um, do you have other uh, poems that, you know, translations of your great aunt's poems? Yeah, she wrote about 40 poems. Some of them um, translated more readily than others. I mean, I think some of them are... So it, I could I kind of talk for hours, it's really yeah. the end. But I mean, I'm very happy for people to to email me or something after the event yeah. or to, to send messages to you and they can get passed on. Yeah, because I'm, certainly. They might be publishable as a collection and they, mm. they, they give, a, give a picture of life in the camp and they're, they're very humorous, which is perhaps one of the most shocking things about them in a way, because I think humour was a way of, of surviving. Right. And maybe that's possibly relevant in that I don't know with, with modern migrations that I think people have to joke and laugh like a kind of grim humour and among all the terrible things that are happening because humour is a way in which we survive. 
Excellent. There are a lot of uh, conversations going on in the chat box. Um, it seems that we are coming to the end of our uh, meeting or the, the end of the event today, but I'm sure that is a good point that the conversation can carry on. And I hope in a few years time, perhaps another two or three years, we'll use the same platform and to see where the journeys go. So hopefully in a few years time, see you again, maybe overland, overseas, we'll speak in, I don't know, Polish, German, Spanish, and many other languages. So let's keep the conversation going by email, by Twitter, and other um, forms of communication. And thank you very much all for participating in this event, and especially to the poets, and to voluntary organizations, and to our translators. And a special thanks to Ambrose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you Jan. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>